Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Zandi, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by a few of my colleagues, two of my trusty co-hosts, uh, Chris Dredes and Marissa Di Natale. Hi, guys. Hey, Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi, guys. And we got Adam, Adam Caymans. Adam Hurricane Caymans. Hey, Mark. I like it. Yeah. yeah. We're going to talk about the hurricane and uh, what that all means. And then we got Mr. Uh, Collier. Collier. Oh. Matt Collier. Damn you, Matt. I, yeah, you make me sorry. say your last name. What the yeah. hell? Uh, sorry about that, Matt? I guess. Yeah. Nice to be here. Nice to see everybody. He forces me, a listener, he, dear listener, he forces me to say his last name. He knows I'm going to mess it up and embarrass myself, but yet he makes makes me say it every single time. Yeah, but, you could feel that look I was giving you waiting. Yeah. <laughs> I can feel the look. I can feel the look. All right, we got a lot to talk about. We got inflation, CPI. That's Matt uh, on the, always here for the CPI number, and uh, we got the hurricane and uh, what all that means. And we got Adam, uh, and we're going to play the game, the stats game, and uh, a lot to cover here. Uh, everyone feeling okay? I mean, I'm a little, I don't know, I'm on edge. I don't know why. Three weeks from the election, hurricanes, anyway. tornadoes in Vero Beach. You know, I don't know. It all seems very cataclysmic, doesn't it? It really, yeah. Jeez, oh, I don't know. How do you? Chris is always the optimist. What? Well, how do you feel, Chris? <laughs> I'm feeling good. Feeling good. Inflation, okay. nice for inflation reports. We'll get to. You know, things are okay, going good. along here. <clears throat> uh, you know, I gotta, I gotta, you know, get some of that good feeling. Uh, uh, maybe we'll we'll see how things go here. But I'm I'm sure it'll all play out. Just just, just fine. Don't read the. Uh, yeah. The news. That's the that's don't the secret. The news. <laughs> right. Don't read the news. Don't be look a very the, uninformed economist. Don't look at the social media. Don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Take a walk. <laughs> Take a walk. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Uh oh, that's the other thing. That's the other thing. This is the first cold day in Pennsylvania. So I go to turn on my heat and guess what? Doesn't no come heat. on. No heat. No, no heat. <laughs> I go, you know, just one more thing to, that's bugging me. You know, one more thing that's bugging me. But anyway, the economy's good, that's for sure. Uh, okay, Matt, what's what's the deal? Tell us about the CPI. So we got September's consumer price index report yesterday. I was a little surprised by Chris there. He was, a, he was very optimistic. I, I don't think it was a terrible report, but it wasn't the one uh, that we wanted. It was stronger than expected. So caveat that. I don't think it alters the, the longer term view, but in general, it, it was on the high side. Headline inflation, so top line CPI number rose 0.2% from August to September. That was above expectations by a little bit. Um, rounded up slightly. It lowered the year ago rate from 2.5% to 2.4%. Uh, so that's you know kind of your attention headline grabbing thing. It was, it was, oh, it was good, comforting. Right? 2.4? That's like you know, right down where you want it to be. The the target for the Fed's two on the consumer expenditure deflator and given construct, but these are different measures. CPI always runs a little little stronger because of the mm -hmm. weights and everything else. So 2.4 is like, like right where you want it, right? No? Yeah, it is. And I think if you look at the monthly change, if you just took, if for a whole year, we got changes just like we got in September. So an annualized basis, we would be at two one, two two. So we even better, even closer to the Fed's target. So that's no, no wait, no, wait. The Fed's target on the, is up for the consumer expenditure deflator. Given the normal margin between the two, I'm I'm taking that in oh. consideration. You're right. I, yes, it would still be two point two. PCE runs a little bit lower. We'd be at oh. the Fed's target. So I, I I think it's an encouraging detail, but. Uh, Energy prices were a big drag. That can't you're not going to bring us down. This is the whole conversation is going to be. I can feel it right now. Matt's going to. I'm already <laughs> on edge. You did say you were edging. I'm on edge, and he's 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 determined to today take this in, in a negative direction. Do you get my this, Marissa? Am I wrong? Well, you Mark, we sense? need to have some balance here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Let her rip, Matt. That's good. But buckle balance. in. I'm not. I'm, no, I'm in an honorary mood. You can tell. <laughs> Uh, I'm an optimist by nature. So energy fell quite a bit in September and you're not going to get that oh, wait, every wait, month. Wait, So you said 0.2, this is top line. That's top the line. whole shooting match, energy, mm -hmm. food, core, so-called core, which is X food and energy up 0.2 in the month, 2.4. Uh, and now you're breaking it down for us. That's right. Okay. So you're going to go to energy first. 
Yes. Okay, Energy prices ahead. fell 1.9%. Yeah. Within that, you have gasoline. This is all pretty well advertised ahead of time, just based off of what we see in, in energy markets. Gasoline prices fell 4.1%. A gallon of gas fell about 20 cents if you look at from August to September. So uh, all encouraging stuff, but not relatively sustainable, but, but good to have uh, mm -hmm. right now. Energy services, which mostly captures electricity prices, um, and most electricity generation comes from natural gas prices. They rose 0.7%. Uh, that was a bit of a surprise. Natural gas prices, it takes a little bit of time for utility companies to, for, to, to these you know, increases in prices to pass through to consumers. Um, June, a little bit of a rise in, in natural gas prices, but they really have been no, falling. They, they're, they're flat, right? They've like been a... falling since mid-June and now have flattened out. So I, I was surprised by that, but it's the kind of thing you can expect doesn't repeat in October, I, I think right. pretty reliably. Um, but we were, we were basically our, you know, breaking down our forecast by component. That was like something we expected to be a flat and, and the 0.7% increase was, uh, right. explained some of our miss. And of course there's a lot of anticipated demand for electricity, you know, related to data centers and AI and all that kind of stuff. You saw that deal between, or I think it's a deal between the state of PA and um, who is it? Is it Microsoft to restart one of the reactors at uh, Three Mile Island to produce more electricity? So, but that's down the road. That that stuff that's not affecting electricity prices today. This this potential demand. Yeah. So I mean, the, yeah. that short term is it short term noise most likely, but uh, oh, okay. enough to kind of uh, okay. throw a little bit of cold water. Um, the bigger story, and it hasn't been a story in a while, is the increase in food prices. So just yeah. top line food, 0.4%. Uh, but within food, effectively, the Bureau of Labor Statistics breaks it out by grocery stores and, and restaurant price food prices. And grocery store prices, the CPI for food at home, rose 0.4%, the fastest monthly growth in almost two years. Um, longer term picture, only up. 1.3% from a year ago. So not you know runaway inflation here, but a stronger month than we've seen. Um, it's also the first time in two years that, which is something I watched just given the, all the, the attention that the grocery store prices get. And you know, these are necessities and consumers are very sensitive or very you know, acutely sensitive to, to grocery store prices. First time in almost two years that average hourly earnings rose by less than grocery store prices. So in that battle of, of being able mm -hmm. to, you know, afford more food and, and that squeeze that uh, rising prices have put on families. Uh, not a great month there. Um, within food at home, you're looking at a really sharp rise uh, in fruit prices. So fruit and vegetables garnered a lot of headlines. You right. get a 2.2% jump in the CPI for fresh fruit. Not something I spend a ton of time thinking about up to this point, but you have um, especially oranges, I, I think are a good case in point. There's an invasive bacteria that's really limited production puts up orange juice prices, orange prices, uh, other citrus as well. Bad weather is a big component. Um, so, you know, I not, saw egg, aren't eggs up again, avian flu or. Yeah. A, yeah. And that's, you know, the kind of the clearest cut supply issue is avian flu is really right. limited egg production. So 8.4% jump in egg prices. They're up about 40% year over year. Um, beef and pork were up more than they have been. I don't have a, 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 a great rationale as to what happened in September, or if that's just yeah. kind of monthly movement. Um, but again, this is a real stretch, but and I don't even, I'm not, I'm not even sure this works. So I'll just mention it because the port strike, because we knew the, the port strike was going to affect most significantly fresh fruit, right? Bananas and apples. And that kind of, I think that that's where we saw also some big increase in price. Is, is that, I mean, can you connect those dots or? Um, I, I think it's, conjecture i mean there's there's a story there but um yeah. you know and markets did react as as it became very clear in september yeah. that this agreement wasn't going to be reached you did see like you know contract prices for for various fruit did rise yeah. um how that flows through and what the government's actually measuring i don't i don't have a, a ton yeah. of confidence that that's that's what, like a futures price it's not the actual yeah. bot price right yeah which okay. i'm sure flows through relatively quickly but not the kind of thing i have a ton of confidence yeah. uh using okay. as like an explanation for right. september Right. Um, so, so, so bottom line on food, you're saying, it, yeah, it was up more than I, we expected, uh, you know, obviously disappointing, but it feels like a bunch of one-off stuff that's hard to explain. I think so. If you don't have a great explanation, I think the easiest one is that this one isn't off. going to be a continuing you know, yeah. trend that we see. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so excluding food and energy, if we move to core CPI, there, uh, the increase from August, September to September was 0.3% second month in a row, uh, a touch higher than expectations. Like and this F1. is where the disappointment is, right? I mean, the overall was fine, but it, the core X food and energy, this is, this is where you're saying it's on the hot side. Um, yeah, if I, I could, would characterize it as we got an upside surprise and we can't blame it on shelter. So for me, that's, oh. uh, that's how I would characterize it. Right. That's most evident in, in core CPI, but, but you know, if that's the, the the drum we've been banging, especially in August that, that not we, everybody really, that it's been a shelter story uh and all of that idiosyncratic measurement stuff and that wasn't the case in, in september which makes me uh, gives me a little bit of pause more than uh my colleagues evidently the um three that's point three point three chris what, do you, what does that mean matt <laughs> Ouch. Nothing, yeah. nothing in particular but there was uh uh yeah markets I, agree with markets barely reacted i mean bond prices i i was i mean i didn't expect it to be the sky was falling but i, I think two-year yield rose like four four or five basis points um, so it didn't seem like it rose four or five basis points. It rose. Uh, I'm sorry. Fell, uh, fell, fell five basis points on <laughs> yeah yesterday. And I don't know exactly what I was expecting, but not long ago, consensus was a 50 basis point cut in November. Now it's, you know, pretty solidly 25. Uh, I thought there would have been some more movement there, but, uh, yeah. So year over year for core CPI rose from 3.2 to 3.3%. We expected it to stay at 3.2%. So the, the higher, Number we are forecasted for 0.2. It came in at 0.3, uh, lifted the year ago rate. Um, so what on the on the core side, uh, excluding food and energy, caused the big increase? I, again, it, uh, not to put words in your mouth, but it felt like these kind of idiosyncratic one-off things. But correct me if I'm wrong. Um, big like transportation services, which is yeah. something we've talked about. So. Uh, auto insurance rose 1.2%. Well, right. That's the kind of thing that we are relatively confident. We know what's happening in the vehicle market. It can't keep costing more to insure these cars if right. they've been falling for a year. Uh, but that's, you know, the, much more of a, it's about triple the share of consumption as uh, fruit is. So, so a surprise there really does move the needle. Uh, auto repairs rose a percent. Airfare was up 3.2%. They all fall under the umbrella of transportation services. And just to complete the thought, if you go back to re motor vehicle repair and insurance, what you're saying is, look, that's still a reflection of the increase in vehicle prices during the pandemic because of the shutdown of the industry and the uh, collapse of inventory. Mm -hmm. But we've seen prices, both new and used, come in pretty significantly here over the past I'd say more than a year now on the on the U yeah. side, at least a couple, maybe even a couple of years, that hasn't translated through yet in terms of repair and maintenance. We're still feeling, but that we, we your sense is again, I'm putting words in your mouth just just to see if I've got it right. Is that uh, that's going to happen? That's that's coming. Maybe the prices won't decline for mm -hmm. repair. I don't think that or insurance, but at least they'll stop rising at one percent every single month. I would even go a step further and say that rolling over has happened. October was weird, but we were for a long stretch, insurance was raising, yeah, you know, growing 1.52% per month. And we have seen slowing, but but September right. was more of a return to it. So return to it. Okay. largely, yes, I, I I definitely agree. Okay. Um it, within core two, I, I just think this story, if it was two reasons why it was a little hot, it was food prices and then just Kind of the drag on overall inflation, you know, headline or core that we were getting from falling goods prices, um, I think that's diminishing. So vehicle market is the best, you know, clearest thing to point to there. Uh, new vehicles rose 0.2 percent. They've fallen almost every month in 2024. They're down a percent relative to a year ago, but you see a modest, you know, slight increase in September. Used vehicles, same thing. They're down five percent relative to a year ago, but rose 0.3 percent in September. Uh, we don't expect any kind of you know turnaround and and, and acceleration in, in vehicle prices, but it's uh, pretty reasonable to suggest that things have bottomed out and that kind of drag that we've been getting on inflation is 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 not going to keep coming. It's going to mm -hmm. be more you know sideways movement, uh, which means the rest of the stuff has to kind of comply. Shelter, all those things that we've been waiting for, uh, become more of the story because the 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 help. The negative contribution from from falling goods prices, apparel, similar story, rose one point one percent. Those things have been falling for a while, but but jumped in September, uh, or at least increased for the first time in a while. So um, that's the general story uh, that, that I, I that I think explains the report. Well, the I guess the good 
it just feels like to me there's a, a lot of uh, volatility in the data month to month. And this was a particularly volatile month. Things that you big, big, big moves in certain prices for certain uh, products and services, some of which we can explain away by avian flu, for example, mm -hmm. but some of which we can't, we don't know, but if you can't explain it. It feels like that's more noise than signal that, you know, that's more, it's not something fundamental going on here. It's something that, you know, will get washed out in subsequent months. The, the, the two areas where that may not be the case, and these are, these work at cross purposes in terms of overall inflation. You mentioned shelter, and it does feel like shelter, the growth in the cost of housing for rent and for home ownership is now, it's moderating and given last, this, this month's read, moderating in a more consistent way. But on the other side is healthcare. And healthcare uh, is uh, seems to be quite strong, and that feels like there's something more fundamental going on there. Do I do I have that roughly right? For sure. Uh, the next point was going to be medical care. Okay. Uh, and we've kind of had a beat on that that you know it takes longer to digest in this as an industry to digest increased labor costs from the pandemic. All those things are working their way through to consumer prices, even though there's not a, a, the way they actually the CPI measures health insurance costs is, is different. But if you look at uh, kind of underlying components, those prices are rising uh, just at a slower rate than, you know, how labor costs uh, flow through restaurants. Uh, those are pretty immediate. It takes a lot longer for healthcare providers to negotiate with insurance companies, uh, negotiate with nurses, uh, unions, uh, and, and and those large, those increased costs flow through to consumers on, on a bit of a lag. So we're seeing some of that. 3.6% uh, year over year for medical care services. That's rising uh, pretty pretty steadily. Uh, we expect it's a little over 4% is where it peaks. Um, but yeah, moving the opposite way of shelter, which is is falling uh, on a year-over-year -year terms is 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 steadily slowing, stubbornly, but but steadily. Hey, Chris, did, did comment on the uh, cost of shelter or housing. Uh, what, what, do you, what did you take away from the report? Yeah, yeah, that's the source of my optimism. That's, optimism. Now we're seeing that come in nicely, kind of matching our expectations. And so- you know, you want to be cautious here. It's a single month, but uh, seems to be moving in the right direction here. We'll continue to see some deceleration. And and that goes to the fact that we can observe rents, market rents, and they've right. been depend almost universally across the different measures that are out there: apartment list, Zillow, so forth and so on. Uh, they're they've been flat for I think two years now, right? Yeah, pretty much. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah. So that should to show up some they, at some point. They, the BLS uses rents to calculate the cost of housing. So if rents market rents have been flat for two years, then you know with a lag for for lots of different reasons, it should show up in much slower growth in the, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index for Housing, and that feels like that's it, it had been happening, but we were getting a little frustrated that it was happening so slowly. But now feels with today with these numbers uh, more like it's happening. Now we're finally we're getting it. Yeah, we had a bit of a head fake last month, yeah. if you recall. There was yeah, kind of a, right. an acceleration all of a sudden that threw markets off a bit, but now it seems like we're getting back to that uh, slowing trend that we saw previously. Okay, okay. So so Matt, you know, add it all up. You know, there's this debate, ongoing debate out there, reasonable debate: is inflation going to continue to moderate? you know, back down to the Fed's target, or is it going to remain more sticky and not go back in or may even begin to accelerate? Given these numbers and your sense of things, where do you where do you land on that question? I don't think my view has changed. I think it's a matter of uh, pace, but there's little reason to expect I, I don't see what the block would be what what's the obstacle that needs to be overcome shelter prices are falling and that's really all it takes for the fed for for uh, return to the fed's inflation target and uh i think the most reasonable argument is that what we're seeing continues um you know maybe it takes a few months longer like it has uh, been slow but um yeah not a great report but nothing to, to alter my view that inflation's heading in the right direction and so you're not in the sticky camp you're in the moderation camp um 
you give me a quarter or two of stickier wage growth if we start to level off at four one, four two. Don't uh, don't talk to me like an economist. Blah 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 blah. I come didn't on. say one. Come on, give me the bottom yeah. line. Give me the bottom uh, line. No, I'm 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 an optimist, despite the uh, contrarian start that, to the podcast. That was not pejorative of, of economists, uh, but uh, well, maybe it was. It was yeah. kind of pejorative. Was <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Do you see how he was dancing though? He was dancing like he was dancing around. You Back know? up to your job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. Yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay. Okay. That's the way to frame it. The sticky camp and the moderation camp. Marissa, are you in the sticky camp or the moderation camp? I'm in, I would say overall, I'm in the moderation camp. Overall. I think there, I think there are components of inflation. There are things out there that are clearly sticky um, but I'm, I'm focused on what shelter's doing, right? Because that is just, that has been the biggest contributor to inflation. It continues to be over the past couple of years. So that's sort of where I'm laser focused. If that keeps moderating, then I feel good about the rest of inflation. And I think all these other components, food and some of these other things we've talked about, I think particularly food is probably just volatility based on these supply constraints or mm -hmm. you know exogenous factors that are influencing the price of food so i'm yeah i'm in the moderation camp moderation camp okay um chris are you in the sticky camp or the moderation camp <laughs> i'm with marissa you're with marissa overall certainly moderating but there are a, a few components we need to watch out for right and uh, Adam, do you have a view on this a sticky or or uh, moder uh, sticky camp or moderation camp? Yeah, I'm going to be boring and agree. Also, I think okay. that if you take the long view, it does seem like all of the components are generally moving in the right direction, and that most of what we're seeing that any evidence of stickiness does seem to be more volatility than anything else. Right. Right. Uh, well, this gets to the producer price index, because we got that also for the month. And then what CPI and PPI mean for the consumer expenditure deflator, which I, that's next week, isn't it? That we get it next week, or maybe it's two, two weeks from now, weeks. two weeks from now. Yeah. And of course, again, that is the headline inflation measure. Overall consumer expenditure deflator inflation is what the Fed is using uh, for its 2% target. And um, so- uh, given the CPI and given the PPI, Matt, do you have a sense of what the PCE, the consumer expenditure deflator, will be? Our first estimate is that the headline PCE deflator will rise 0.1%, which will lower the headline rate to 2%. Ooh. Two point, yeah, which is, really? 2% yeah. on the nose. There you go. I will say our, our quick, uh, Justin and I are working on this morning since PPI came out, um, we are on the lower end and I'm going to have a better sense of why. Okay. I mean, it's usually a pretty tight band just given that we have all the input data from the cpi and the ppi mm -hmm. um so that's a good thing core 0.2 percent uh which will lower the uh year ago rate to 2.5 for core pc um and, and why because the core cpi is 0.3 and we know that the weights in the cpi are higher on housing than on medical care mm -hmm. but they're i believe they're reversed in the consumer expenditure flavor which would suggest that we get a stronger number in the core PCE as opposed to core CPI, but we're not getting that. What's the reason for that? The first is that like medical care, the medical care that we see in the CPI, which yeah. was concerning, that's actually not what, that's that's one of the components that we use the PPI and there it was ah. better, it's a better story. Um, oh, so see. so I hospitals, see. physician services, those two things, it's a little tougher to untangle month to month changes because at that level, it's not seasonally adjusted, but uh, 0.10%, no, no change in those components. Whereas physician services rose like 0.9% in the CPI, what actually flows through to the PCE uh, comes from the PPI. It was much more mild. So interesting. Yeah. Right. And also, I guess motor vehicle insurance and repair isn't, isn't that that also, also from comes the PPI from, that does come from the PPI, but I don't know exactly what that did today. Um, okay. So, okay. Okay. Take a look at that. Also, okay. Well, that's two things are measured differently in, mm -hmm. in the, um, the PCE versus the CPI. So things like insurance, they're netted out when PCE is computed. So if you, it's not just what the consumer pays, it's also what the consumer would get back in a uh, claim say, right. from an insurance company. So 
there is some measurement differences with some of those like imputed costs versus net and, and net costs in the two surveys. So they're not really apples to apples. Did I tell you guys my experience with the motor vehicle insurance and the, the driving uh, test? Did, you, no. did I tell you this? No. Okay. So <laughs> I got my motor vehicle insurance bill and it was eye popping, right? I, extraordinarily ex huge increase. So I, you know, I never have called up my insurance company ever, but I called them. I won't tell you who it is, but they'd advertise on TV. So I call up, uh, the, and it took me a little bit, but I got to somebody and they were very nice, very helpful. And it turns out, you know, I had a lot of tort protection and I probably didn't need it. So I scaled that back and I got my insurance premium down a little bit, not a lot. And then the fellow says, well, you know, we've got this program where we track your driving with your cell phone. I, well, I, I did, I did it. <laughs> I made the mistake. I said, oh, that sounds kind of cool. Kind of interesting. So everyone in my family got the got into the program. And of course, it turned into a contest. Like, who's the best driver? Who's the best driver? And it uh, turns out the best driver actually is my youngest daughter, which is great. You know, made me feel really good. They test your braking. They test your acceleration, time of day. Who else? I don't know who else they're tracking. And they give you a score. And she, she turned out to be the best driver. She drives like an old lady, you know, uh, uh, which is, again, I'm all for it. That's, That's not necessarily a good thing. No. Well, I don't know. Uh, tend not to get into accidents. I, I won't tell you who the worst driver it was. I'll, the only thing I'll say about that is it wasn't me. It wasn't mm. me. It uh -huh. wasn't me. <laughs> exactly. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that really got me. My insurance premium went up, not down. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Uh, anyway, I'm, I would unenroll from that program. I, oh, I'm I'm done. I'm done yeah. with that. Yeah, I'm done with that. So there was a big expose written about this. This. Oh, really? Thing. Oh, geez. And that basically, insurance companies they will only penalize you based on your driving. They won't actually reward you for your oh. driving. Really? And they're using your data in a whole bunch of other different ways, potentially. That's outrageous. That, um, mm. Yeah. I'll send you the article. Wow. Yeah, please. Yeah. It's distressing. I, I should have talked about this earlier. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so I'm definitely shopping next year. Just just saying. Just shop, I'm going to be shopping. And this is like your insurance went up on the same vehicle. You didn't get a new car or anything. No, no, no. Yeah. 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 See, I got a new car and mine went up substantially well, by the way i've been in a new car it's like i'm in a spaceship it's that it's a really cool car yeah <laughs> really cool car it is so i don't know how much of it i went from having a really old car to a brand new electric oh. car so yeah. i was expecting it to go up but the amount that it went up was really shocking and i don't know how much of it is like just the new car versus them taking the opportunity to adjust my rate and yeah, I didn't see, call them. No, you can see why there's this disconnect between the happy talk, like a, you know, economists like us and the America average American family, because they they get something like that. It like the, like it's hard to look beyond that, right? I mean, just just really. And by the way, that all goes back to the pandemic. You know, pandemic hits, chip plants shut down globally, no global production, inventories collapse, prices go up. It ultimately shows up in repair and maintenance costs and then insurance, you know, mm -hmm. so it's direct reflect of the pandemic. Anyway, talking about insurance, <clears throat> unless anyone has else to say on inflation or the CPI or PPI or PCE, anything before we move on to Adam Hurricane Caymans? I'll just say I got my home insurance oh. bill. That was a shocker. Was it really? Yeah. 30%. Wow. Increase over wow. the previous Premium. year. Yeah. What well, that and in Pennsylvania, right? Not in uh, why? Why right. do you suppose that is? I, what are you guys doing over there in that house? Uh, nothing. Have you ever nothing. filed a claim? <laughs> I've never filed a claim, nothing like that. So just a uh, oh my goodness. And I shopped around. I guess I was getting a good deal previously, perhaps, because I oh. I can't I can't beat it. So oh my goodness. anyway, that wow. just to go to your point. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is a definitely... segue. Great segue into uh, what's going down on down in, in Florida and south the southeastern part of the United States. And I should say, you know, obviously we 
you know, uh, our thoughts and prayers go to all the folks there uh, in that region of the country because that, you know, that's pretty tough. Uh, so uh, a lot of hard work dead ahead. Uh, but uh, Adam, you want to give, give us a sense of uh, this most recent hurricane, Hurricane Milton, and how you're thinking about it in terms of its economic consequence? Maybe you can just give us also kind of a broader sense of the the, the framework you use to try to understand the economic impact of a, a storm like this. Sure. Yeah, I'll I'll start there. I'll zoom out a little bit because okay. there's a lot of different ways to think about these these storms. So we've been doing this for a while, and what we typically look at when a hurricane or other sort of event, natural disaster occurs, is lost output and physical damage. Right. So the lost output number, where basically just looking at the the counties that are affected, trying to understand the size of the economies, what types of different industries they're concentrated in, how those industries might be affected, how long those places might be shut down. Uh, we rely pretty heavily on maps of power outages across counties. So right, it's pretty clear that when a large portion of a county is without power, their economy is not going to be doing much of anything. Uh, so all of that factors into the lost output piece. That is the smaller piece of the number, but I think that's the piece that has broader macroeconomic consequences, and certainly in terms of like the variables that we think about. Uh, the other larger piece is around damage, right? And so to get a sense of the damage, we start by looking at the housing stock. We look at the median single family home price in an area. And then, you know, where we can, we pull in information on commercial real estate, on the number of automobiles. Um, we make some assumptions based on past events on how you can convert that into personal property outside of the actual home or the auto itself. And based on that, we come up with a range of what we think the damage will look like. And it's probably important to emphasize that this is not an estimate of insured losses. Uh, it is just an estimate of it's, it's sort of an all-in estimate of all losses insured, uninsured. You know, it can include things like infrastructure, other things that may not be kind of explicitly accounted for in insured losses. And in many cases, the insured losses can be a very small percentage of the total loss, right? Depends on you know what, where, who's getting struck, what's getting struck by the disaster. But often, the ins what's insured is actually not that big a piece of the pie. Exactly. And actually, these last two storms are a perfect example of that. So Helene, right, it, it moved up the coast in the southeast. It did most of its damage in the Carolinas, uh, particularly area, the area around Asheville, North Carolina, is where probably the most catastrophic damage occurred. But because most of it was flood damage, uh, typical homeowners policies do not cover uh, flood damage. So mm -hmm. There's some level of insurance that people can get from the federal government, the, the National Flood Insurance Program, but penetration rates for that sort of insurance are, are not very high. So a large share of losses from Helene are uninsured. Whereas in Milton, where we have a lot of a lot more wind damage and sort of the, you know, traditional in quotes, uh, hurricane damage, the share of losses that are insured are going to be much higher. Got it. Got it. In the, in the case of Helene, what is, what is your damage estimate? So we've revised our damage estimate. Uh, we started a little bit Which lower. Which is not unusual, right? Because there's not a, at all. No, a, this a is a zillion uncertainties here. And as you get more information, I mean, a lot of moving parts uh, in terms of trying to calculate this, right? Okay, exactly. I mean, anybody who estimates something like this a day or two out from the storm and doesn't change their estimates, uh, I, I would not trust them for a second. Uh, so I, we are now at but somewhere between, again, we have a wide range here because there's still a lot that is unknown about this, but uh, roughly $40 billion, we think, in damage, uh, probably plus or minus $10 billion, So just to give you a sense of what that range may look like. Uh, lost output, we're thinking somewhere in the order of 7 to $9 billion with roughly half of that likely concentrated in North Carolina, particularly in the western part of North Carolina. So it's a it's a relatively small area, both in terms of uh, the size and economic activity that's really bearing the brunt here. So uh, 
those economies, and again, I point to Asheville as being the one that uh, of all metro areas in the US that's most affected, it's really a devastating blow for an economy like that. But compared to Milton, actually, the price tag is lower overall. So in terms of the macroeconomic picture for the US, Milton is probably the more severe of the two. So, so kind of what's the midpoint of your, your damage estimate for Helene? That, and that's total yeah. damage, economic loss, plus insured, plus uninsured. We're, we're not making a distinction there. What is the total damage, right. roughly? Total, I would say the midpoint there is $48 billion. $48 billion. Okay. Yes. And again, this is can be revised as we move forward here. It can and, and almost certainly will be revised. And as time goes on, that range will narrow too, right? Right, right now, what we're sort of thinking about is a range of 38 to 58 billion. But as we get more certainty and see sort of just how extensive the damage is and, and rebuilding begins, we'll, we'll be able to, to narrow that range. Okay. And, uh, we're probably let's not go into the cost of Milton yet because we're still trying to figure that out. It's still early days, but it feels like broadly speaking, it, it's going to be at least fifty billion dollars, right, in total loss. I, yeah. I think that's right. So, okay. uh, Milton. One of the big differences between Milton and Helene, other than what we talked about with the you know, insured rates and things along those lines, is just where Milton hit and the extent of the disruption and the damage. So. Mark, you know this full well. Um, you're you have a home on the Atlantic coast of Florida, which yeah. is not particularly close to where Milton made landfall, but it spawned tornadoes kind of throughout the state. The 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 wind was so strong, and the, the, there was enough rain that we saw a fair amount of damage really throughout Florida, with the exception being the Panhandle was unscathed. But outside of that, there's really no part of Florida that emerged totally unscathed right. from the storm. And uh, Sarasota County, some areas a little bit to the south of there. So, you know, kind of between, I would say, Sarasota and maybe Naples, uh, you had very extensive damage. Um, the Tampa area, it was not hit as hard as it could have been. And I think when people were really worried about the storm earlier in the week, the fear was that there would be a direct or close to direct hit on Tampa, which would have been catastrophic and that probably would have put the storm up there with you know the worst costliest natural disasters of all time in this country we dodged that but it was still strong enough and there was a, enough of an impact in enough you know large to mid-sized economies that that it, it's a it's a fairly high price tag uh, relative certainly relative to helene and relative to most storms for the last few years right so the the obvious economic damage is what we're talking about right now the uh, disruption to the economy the lost output that that is, results and then of course the property damage uh that uh, at, least, uh, at least to my mind's eye is offset to some degree the the the, the ultimate economic fallout is ult is offset to some degree when we're talking about these these costs, we're going to get to the, there's going to be, there's other costs, obviously, which we'll get to in just a second, including the insurance and migration patterns, all that. But in terms of these costs, you get generally, we've seen the federal government step in and provide support. And my, in, again, in my mind's eye, uh, looking at uh, these storms over the years, in recent times, when I say recent, say the last 25 years, the federal government makes generally makes every makes the economy whole. What I mean by that is whatever is not insured by the private markets and also the economic loss is covered generally by federal government support coming in and helping out so that the the net cost is basically a wash. Now again, this is there this is obviously a disaster. It's very disruptive. And in initially, it's it, it it's a big pro economic problem, but the money starts flowing pretty quickly. Economic activity picks up. In fact, at some points, the economy is growing more faster than it otherwise would have. And at at the end of all of that, several years down the road after the reconstruction, the economy is kind of sort of back to where it would have been uh, without the storm. At least that's been the case so far. You know, uh, over the last twenty five years, do I have that roughly right? Yes. But with exceptions, right? Okay. So I think that's roughly right. But 
there are examples where that has not been the case. Katrina is the obvious example, right? Where mm. federal aid flowed in, it, it probably was insufficient, but especially when you look at the, the scale of the damage there and the fact that it that New Orleans was an economy where that was struggling already, where the private insurance market and the state was not able to kind of step in to the same extent uh, as we've seen in some other disasters, that mm. led to permanent out migration. And that that can happen. I think you're right, though, for the most part, the government and, and FEMA steps in, usually kind of partisan squabbling is mostly put aside. And uh, I think we're, we're seeing this in North Carolina, despite some of the narratives out there that there, there does seem to be a robust federal response. I would expect the same in Florida. I do worry kind of in the long run, uh, mm. there, there may be reasons to, you know, think of if storms as we expect are going to continue to get more frequent more severe and there 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 may be only there may be limitations on what the federal government can, or, can do. political right i mean you can almost feel it now right because uh there's some reticence on the part of uh the speaker of the house to come back into session to appropriate more emergency funds uh, for fema the the emergency management uh it's administration right uh the uh, Federal Emergency Management Administration. They're the guys that disperse the money uh, and there's some hesitance to do that. And then that may be signaling something going forward that the federal government, because of the budgetary costs, may not actually step up to the degree they have at least over the last quarter century. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we saw squabbling back when Superstorm Sandy hit. Yeah, right? exactly. And that was more of a red state, blue state thing. But yeah. there, there's, there's nothing that I think eventually is immune from partisan politics. So that that certainly could be part of the story in the long run, too. And, and you know, these storms, it feels like the number, the damage is like coalescing around 50 billion. You know, it's like, you know, category three, four storm hitting the peninsula of Florida or Texas. It's about 50 billion, give or take. It, that's what it feels like, you know, something it, around. Yeah. Okay, and keep in mind, right, this is when feels like the narrative and you know I'm, I'm knocking on a lot of wood here as i say this yeah. but it seems to be that the narrative is usually the worst case scenario was avoided right and we're still getting yeah. to this 50 billion yeah. up north so that that's right. what scares me is you know one of these times we're not going to avoid the worst case scenario right not to, right we're in right. a bad mood before before we started this conversation right i probably shouldn't uh get too dark here but eventually there you know, it could go a lot higher so another very significant economic impact is what Chris was just talking about, the impact on homeowners insurance. So Chris, I know you've done a lot of work in this area already. Uh, do you want to describe uh, what you're learning about uh, the impact on homeowners insurance and what that means for property values and the economy? Yeah, uh, sure. I, I guess I you wrote a great first. paper, by the way. So I don't know if it's in the public domain, but they could Google Dorides. And uh, you got to. Everyone's got to learn how to pronounce, spell your last name. It's not easy. Small D. Don't remember. Don't forget. Small D E, capital R I T I. Those are two different words, right? D D. Reed. They are. They are. Reed, and, he, right. and he says it. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. Uh, but anyway, you can find that on the web, I believe. Right? If you look, you should be able to. Or okay. just uh, contact me. Okay. There you go. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Make it easy. Um, so definitely still a work in progress. A, a big issue in terms of evaluating the impact on insurance is just insurance is somewhat fragmented, right? Every state has its own rules, own, own regulatory bodies. Pulling the data together can be difficult just because every policy is different, right? You have different deductibles and whatnot. So uh, we're making some progress here, but just to say, I think we're still uh, learning. Um, I th perhaps the biggest mystery that we've seen over the last few years is just that insurance, we haven't seen insurance premium uh, increases really impact housing markets to a large degree in terms of either sales or prices. Mm -hmm. I, I attribute that to just the low interest rate environment kind of substituting away for some of those higher premiums that, you know, yes, you have to pay more for your insurance, but you're getting, you got a, a deal on the interest rate, kind of see that uh, net, net itself out. I think going forward here, that is starting to change. And certainly in certain, some of those Florida markets, you are seeing home buyers or home owners changing their behavior because of the insurance premium, right? They're, they're seeing more sales, right? People who want to get out and move. And you're also seeing home buyers being much more sensitive to the potential for 
insurance uh, to increase going forward here. So as these hurricanes come through, we know they have big impacts in terms of the insurance availability in some of these uh, areas. And I, that's, I, I see as the key risk here, um, not only for the properties that are directly impacted by the storm, but in Florida, for example, you have the uh, state sponsored citizens insurance uh, program the premiums actually will be redistributed across the entire state if there's mm. a, a shortfall in that program. So you could see the impacts of this storm, not only in the areas that, you know, had took a direct hit, but throughout the state, you know, parts of the, parts of the, the state that are far away from uh, the hurricane itself. So I, I think that's certainly something to pay attention to and be mindful of as we, as we think about uh, the effects of the storm yeah, on insurance. Yeah. Uh, I think you said this, but just to reiterate, I mean, for for many many, we do a lot of house price modeling, right? We produce models to produce to project house prices, and for lots of different purposes. And for years, the you know you try to get homeowners insurance into the model, not so much. Not it didn't so matter. Much. But now we're it, it's it's really meaningful, right? I mean, it's show, you can actually visually see it. You could do a so called scatter plot. On a horizontal axis, you can look at homeowners insurance across, let's say, states, and on the on the on the uh, the vertical axis, the y axis, took a look at house price changes since the since before the pandemic, and you can visually see the relationship. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You are starting to see that kind of uh, play out here. I, I guess what we find overall nationally, yeah, the, the the increase in premiums is a big deal, but it doesn't have that much of an impact, right? Even my thirty percent increase in a premium. Right. right, it's still in dollar terms a relatively manageable or small amount. So it does that doesn't really matter. But what we where we really see the issue, of course, is in these areas that are uh, seeing the the highest insurance premium increases. Right, that where it's you know people paying tens of thousands of dollars a year for their insurance. That's clearly um, having an, a real effect. And increasingly, uh, some can't get insurance at all. And that also right. is that not only in the residential, not only in the uh, residential market, but it's in the single family market. It's in the multifamily market. Property developers are starting to have, uh, and owners are, are starting to have, have difficulty getting insurance or, or That's getting, right. getting yeah. affordable you think about insurance. all those, um, the condos in, uh, in yeah. Miami, right? There's yeah. been a lot of talk right. around those. I think yeah, that, that, that whole market is going to shift. I don't, I think some of those buildings are not, are just not going to be sustainable as condominiums. They're going to have to become, uh, they're going to have to sell out to a developer or and turned into apartments or some some type of uh, other structure because the uh, the premium increase that would be needed to restore these properties or bring them up to code is just too high. So I think you're going you're going to see some real shifts over the next couple of years as a result of just the risk of these uh, hurricanes and storms. Let alone if if we and when another one hits. Yeah, the, I mean the the economic consequences of this are significant. I mean it's a significant cost, but it's also perhaps what's needed, right? I mean, I mean, it's if, if you're going to build right on the ocean in yeah. harm's way, uh, I mean, we that doesn't make sense, right? For anybody, that uh, the costs are just too high. So this is how it, you would think it would should work, right? The the market's speaking, it's saying, hey. Go ahead. You want to build there? Fine. You want to live there? Fine. But you, this is going to be costly because the risks here are very high. And the, hopefully the, the idea that is that that will ultimately dissuade development in places that are going to experience you know these kind of natural disasters. Would, would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, I, I definitely. I think this is actually the most direct way that- The most direct the, way. All the climate yeah. change risk that we're talking about actually gets transmitted into the into the market and into decisions, right? Because we can run scenarios that go out 50 years and come up with the results, but it's very hard to translate that into what that means for me as a as a household or a, as a homeowner. But seeing the the impact on my insurance, well, now that's that's immediate, right? My behavior is going to change because it's not just a, a theoretical number out there. It's now impacting my pocketbook today. So in terms of how we think about kind of those larger longer term risks and bring them into more immediate decisions. I think that it's through these insurance markets, right? That's how these things are going to play out. Well, it gets to the other major potential economic consequences, and that's the impact on migration flows, right? I mean, 
you may, Adam, turning back to you again, you mentioned that in the context of Katrina. There, that was obvious. There was mass outflows from New Orleans to the, to the surrounding areas. Have we observed any kind of migration effects yet as a result of these storms? And do you expect them to occur? Not really. I think not most really. of these storms, well, on the first part, uh, I yep. would say not really. Uh, the second part, that's a little bit more more complicated. Uh, on the, we have seen similarly strong storms. Hurricane Ian a couple of years ago comes to mind. And we saw immediate out migration from like the Naples metro area, Lee County, Florida, which is where that had the largest impact. But people generally come back and rebuild. And again, a lot of that just has to do with the fact that even though insurance premiums are high, they are able to either get the coverage that they need, you know, they pay quite a bit for it, but they still have coverage or the federal government steps in, makes people whole and they they continue to rebuild. And I think that does create you know, sort of some strange incentives, right? It goes back if the private market is going to be the thing that that compels builders and individuals to move inland, move away from these vulnerable coastal areas. The fact that you know, the federal government is generally there to provide a backstop, that you've got that these state uh, programs in place in Florida where there are insurers of last resort that people can rely on, it, it does lead to uh, to rebuilding. And people generally are not in, in large numbers. I think going forward, I don't expect that this storm is going to be all that different in that respect. I would expect that people are going to, you know, they may be displaced for a little while, but we'll see healthy rebuilding, I think, along the Gulf Coast again. I think down the road, the thing that, that moves the needle is what Chris was talking about, that I think ultimately if insurance premiums are high enough, if housing affordability, and eventually, right, we'll get to a point where the impact on housing affordability is severe enough that it's going to cause people to think twice about moving to Florida or staying in Florida. I still think we're probably a decade plus away from that moment, but I think that is that is coming eventually. I wonder, here, here's, the, here's the thing. This is the third big storm that's hit that part of Florida, south to kind of the west coast of Florida. You, had, you mentioned Ian, that's two years ago, and then you had two this year. So, And the, the season's not over, by the way. It's, it's still going here. And these are pretty meaningful storms. And, you know, typically a, a good... Forecasting rule of thumb is if you've got two data points, you can draw a line. If you can draw a line, you can do a forecast. And that's how people do forecasts. A lot of people do forecasts. And now they've got three data points, all making that line look pretty strong. And they're saying, oh, you know, maybe this isn't, you know, these storms aren't a one in 10 year event. Maybe this is an every year event. And if you saw it, thought that, if you thought it's an every year event, wouldn't that affect where you decided to move? Maybe, maybe it doesn't mean you don't go to Florida. Maybe what it means is you're not on the, you're on the mainland side of the intercoastal waterway. You're not on the beach side of the intercoastal water. I, I don't know. I'm just asking. I just wonder about that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a fair point. I, I also think inertia can be pretty powerful. Uh, and I mean, we saw this in Houston a while back, right? Hurricane Harvey hit a couple of years before that. It wasn't a hurricane, but you had, I think it was a one, one in 500 year flood event followed by another one in 500 year flood event. I think mm. it, it's like two out of three years. And I mean, by that logic, right? You would expect people to draw that line and maybe start to move out of an area like that. And we haven't really seen it happen yet. I mean, at some point though, you're right. If it's, you know, year after year after year of major storm hitting, like, yes, I think. I, I, think. I have to tell you, like I'm, I have a lot of family in Florida. I see, I see lots of Florida and some of these beat these, uh, the damage these storms do, I look at it and it's, it's, it's literally dystopic. You can see pools of condos cracked in half and sitting on the beach, you know, it's like, really, you're going to rebuild that. I mean, are, it, you know, uh, and I've seen these beaches for decades. And if I go back decades ago, compared to today, the high tide is up to the seawall. That was never the case. That was never the case, you know, 20, 25 years ago. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm perplexed by it. I'm perplexed by it. But anyway, okay. We, anything else you want to call out on this issue? There's a lot of stuff here and we're, you know, writing a lot about it and talking a lot about it. And of course we're working with our colleagues in the rest of Moody's that do very detailed work on calculating the insured losses. And we'll be, have a lot more to say about that, but, um, uh, anything else before we move on? I want to... Oh, there's one more thing I want to call out, but I can yeah. save it for the stats game because I think I have a stat. What's that? that? 
I think I can save it for the stats game because I think I have a I have a statistic that I think will lead to one other point I want to make here. But okay, okay, I'll allow you to segue. Well, okay, very, very good. So, uh, guys, any other things you want to call Marissa? Anything else you want to call out on the on the storms? No, No, okay, okay. Let's play the game, the stats game. We each uh, put forward a stat uh, statistic. Mm -hmm. The rest of the group tries to figure that out with clues, deductive reasoning, questions. The best stat is one that isn't so easy. Although I'm playing this game, I've been hot the last couple three weeks. I don't know if you've noticed, but like, I'm making it this game feel really easy. I'm just saying. Yeah, I, mean, I wasn't here there. last week, yeah. so. Oh, that's true. She missed. She missed it. Wasn't I hot last week, Chris? <clears throat> you were. You were. Yeah. Although yeah. Dante used the stat that I used the week before, which I, <laughs> I think yeah. is disqualifying. <laughs> Damn you, Matt! I heard it, and Mr. I'm... Collier. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Negative it, today, huh? What's that? So maybe yeah. A little maybe. negative today. <laughs> Who Matt is? Matt, yeah, yeah. I know he's he's bringing. I feel good. Out. I feel yeah. good. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> uh, and uh, one that's not so hard, we never get it. And if it's apropos to the topic at hand, which a lot of good topics here, all the better. Marissa, Mar- uh, tradition has it goes first. Marissa, you're up. Plus point five four percent. In the uh, CPI report? Yep. Ooh, is it a certain pro- a monthly percent change in a certain product or of good, a certain good or service? It is a monthly change, yep. Ooh, 0.5. I have four. You're going to second. That's digit. a big increase. It's not, that's. That's right. It is a big in- increase. <laughs> <laughs> you win. Uh, is it on the good side? Of the CPI? Is it a good? At what point do you question so much that yeah. you just got to take a guess? Yeah. Oh, uh, no, it's not on the good side. It's on the service side. It's not in the housing. <laughs> Let's take a guess, guys. So in medical care, medical care, physician's offices. No. Okay. Okay, Chris, you're up. Pick one. Matt's uh, cogitating over there. I think it's he's a, been... it's a broad it's a broader category than oh sometimes. it's a broader category. Yeah. And it's 0.54, right? That's correct. Yeah. 0.54. Big increase. Month over month. Month over month. Okay. Uh, food away from home. No. Transportation services. I'm just it's not not housing. No. Uh, we know that. Uh a broad category. Broad wow. category. <clears throat> Uh, not medical care, recreational Carol? activities. What was the, uh, super core was a little less than that, right? Oh, super. No, core. it's super core. No. Is it? Okay. Oh, okay. Super okay. Core. Ah, yeah. Ah. It is super core. So this is Ooh, okay. core services. So yeah. services X energy and X shelter was up 0.54% over the month, which is the largest monthly increase we've seen in super core since March. In so, why do you call that super core? Uh, because I think it kind of goes to the theme of this, where yep. it was like the inflation was coming from all these other things, not shelter for, you know, for once, right? Right. Um, right. Shelter actually moderated, but all the other components of service inflation were up pretty strongly. So super core is up 4.6% year over year. Um, so still pretty elevated. I mean, that's that's down significantly from where it had been um, earlier in the year and, and last year, but it did tick up month over month and year over year. And of course, Supercore is the uh, measure that Powell called out back when he was to when he was keeping rates very high because he said that, look, this as long as this is high, I got it's going to be very difficult for us to ease monetary policy. He's not talked it, about it recently, but that's that's where it came from. Right. And I think it goes to that sticky versus moderation debate, yeah. too, right? Because the things that are in some of these services are, shelter is obviously sticky, but some of these other services, like we're just talking about insurance, motor vehicle insurance, uh, motor vehicle maintenance, repair, those kinds of things tend to be sticky because they follow kind of the prices of other goods and or services, and it may take time for them to adjust. Um, so this is where, you know, when you ask me, am I in the moderation or the sticky yeah. camp? 
Overall, right. I'm in the moderation camp, yeah. but you do see stickiness when you look, particularly in services for something. Yeah, yeah no, that's a good one. Um, yeah, because I, I, when you said I'm in the moderation camp, you hesitated, and that's the hesitation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good one. You can good certainly one. find things that are sticky. Yeah, right. Uh, okay, Adam, you're up. And All right. We already have a hint. So, it's, it's got to do with natural disasters. It, it has to do with natural disasters. Now, this is... It's very obscure, so I'm going to give you some hints here. Um, no, no hints. Is, Just give us the number. Well, Just you'll the, never get that. If I say the number, I mean, I'm pulling. Oh, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, feeling, feeling pretty good. Give us the number and then. Oh, uh, you're all right. All right. I, okay. This is brash. Okay. Uh, <laughs> negative 157,300. Okay. Give us the clues. Okay. <laughs> That's a per capita per household. Yeah, <laughs> no, it is. It is a number of jobs and it's from September, 2017. Or it is so, so what's the question? We're supposed to tell well, you what, what is it? What what it's not it's not just is this specifically what is it? Harvey's effect on employment. You're you've got the right the right idea. Wilma? It's not that, but is it is it um, you're asking us what, what natural disaster resulted in that loss of in that there law? has been that there there was a job a loss of jobs. I'm talking about specific geography. In September 2017. Oh. Uh, Texas. No. Hmm. California. Because there was no, a lot of fires. California. No. I, Do you I want know. us to guess the geography? Yeah. Wait, was it yeah. Sandy? Oh, Puerto Rico. No. Hmm. No. I mean, I can, a, I can. I'm just okay. glad this isn't Mets related, but go ahead. Oh, is that's, that's fan? Fan? Is he oh, a Mets big, fan. Big Mets oh, fan. that's coming yeah. now. I was debating how much content <laughs> did you hear of oh, you guys. You know, yesterday I wore my Met shirt for. I saw uh, that. For, yeah, for a nice large audience. Yeah, that, had, I don't want to know how that happened, but go ahead. <laughs> He's from Long Island. No? Is yeah, he yeah, from yeah, Long yeah. Island. Oh, that's how it happened. Yeah, pe people don't just become Mets fans. You know, they <laughs> haven't had much success the last forty <laughs> no, years. So. That. Yeah, that's not that's not what you choose if you had a choice. Well, I have uh, to say, with the Phillies out, I'm rooting for Mets Yankees. That would be kind of fun. That would be fun. Yeah, that would be really fun. Has that ever happened, Mets Yankees? Once. Yes. Once. Okay. Uh, it didn't. It didn't go well. Oh. <laughs> Things don't tend to end well for the Mets. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So what's the deal? Anyway. Okay. Um. This is the number of jobs lost in Florida in September of 2017. Um. The reason I'm mentioning it is right. That was when Hurricane Irma hit. Uh, um, Hurricane Irma struck during the payroll reference week. Uh, oh. In Florida and. Most of the big storms of the last few years have not hit during the reference week. Uh, Milton did. So I think we could see a very significant impact on the top line payroll number for October, which given, right, that this is ah. days before the election. Uh, right. I, I mean, I think oh, this, this, geez. Is, this really has a, 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 the potential to influence the narrative. What date is the... Uh... Employment report come out. I believe you can double check, but I believe it's the first. Remember first. Remember the first. Oh goodness. Yeah, you're right. That's going to happen. Is. So there's going to be a lot of hand wringing, and so this is actually, I think, a potential risk for the Harris campaign. That is an interesting point. Uh, yeah, it's, it's almost certainly going to happen, right? Because when you, when you say I, what happens is that for the employment report, the BLS does its survey of his businesses and households in the week that includes the 12th of the month. And so that's this week, right? Because yeah, the 12th, 12th is tomorrow. So I wasn't tomorrow. totally clear on how we deal with Saturdays, but I think that's this week. It, it, I think it's does, this week. Yeah, they, they count a week starting Sunday. Yeah. Oh man, I, you know you're right. It's going to have an impact. Now so let's would, see, they work any, although if you're working even an hour in that week, you're counted as employed. It'll affect the hours worked for for sure. For sure, that'll get a big hit. Yeah. But maybe it won't affect the employment number. Maybe, but again, like this is when where did this I hit? This hit. What day did this hit? This hit. This hit on what, Wednesday, Wednesday night. Wednesday that night. would be the ninth. Marissa, oh, if, so, if, the, if it starts Sunday, does that mean that? So this the, tomorrow is the end of the reference week. Yeah, that's right. Tomorrow's the last. So if anybody, day so if anybody had worked. Week earlier in the week and hadn't evacuated it, then it would like, because if they worked one hour, as Mark said. That's right. Yeah, That's right. Okay. Okay. It is possible. But I will say, right, that closures and evacuations were already happening at the beginning yeah. of the week. 
That's right. Good and we yeah. schools were closed across the state. I think from Tuesday afternoon through Thursday, and in the Tampa area, kind of down through the Gulf Coast, I, people were evacuating. Wow. Very early. I think a lot of stores were closed. I, I think this is going to have a really significant impact on the payroll number. So well, that's very that number was a little tortured, but I, I really wanted to get to this point. No, no, no. That's yeah. a great, a great point. Yeah. Especially I mean, airports in... closed on Wednesday. Disney World closed. Yep. I on, actually on looked. What, this was, this what was day did that close? Of... Do you know? I think Wednesday it was Wednesday. Thursday. It closed Wednesday. early. Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah, no was... refunds. No refunds. <laughs> Are you making that up? No, really. Oh, wow. You're not making that up. Not making no, that refunds. Up. That's, no refunds. That's no refunds. Really, act of God. <laughs> well, at least according to a neighbor. So. Oh, okay, okay. I actually was looking at this. This was a backup stat of mine here. Disney World has now been closed seven times or seven uh -huh. days over the last two years because of hurricanes. Wow. The prior, I think, seventeen or eighteen years, I think there were four days that it had closed. So wow. just another measure of how frequent and wow. severe these hurricanes are. Right. Okay, I want to go next. All right. In $160 billion. And Adam, you should know this. That's Hurricane a, related. Hurricane related. Katrina's price tag? Yeah, Katrina's price tag in today's dollars, in today's dollars. So that gives you context. So mm -hmm. if, if Helene is, say, around 50, Milton... A little north of that, we don't know, but like potentially north of that. This is Katrina was three, you know, according to those estimates, three give you a sense of magnitude, three times as large, more than three times as large. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was a pretty good stat. Yeah, okay. Uh, you want to do one more, Matt? You want to go? Sure. Um, 11.53 percent CPI. No. Is it in is it inflation related? Yeah. No. No. Is it a stat that came out this week? Is it related to natural disasters? No. And yes, it did come out this week, but came not, out to the, do. not the increase no. in initial claims, is it? No. No. That jumped because of the uh, Helene, right? Helene. Yeah. 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 In North Carolina in particular. Think uh, positively. You guys are too negative. Think positively. Eleven point that five. Ratio? It is, Chris. That's ah, right. Yeah, the debt one, service Chris. ratio from the Federal Reserve, yeah. uh, which is quarterly. So it's from Q2. And I, I likely everybody here encounters the same, like, you know, how is the U.S. economy doing so well? Something's got to break. That There's a kind of uh, sense that I get talking to people, I assume, uh, that everyone else is familiar with. <laughs> and one of the things I always point to or I think about is uh, how well households have managed debt. 11.53 is the same as the first quarter. Um, it's a little higher than it was a year ago, and uh, but it's still lower than history. And, and what this measures is kind of minimum payments due. So all the bills that households have to pay as a share of disposable income. So it's still low, rising a little bit, but but low historically. And you know, that's given, that's kind of maintained breathing room in household budgets and allowed them to keep spending. And it's you know, the key reason, I think, that the U.S. economy is doing really well and the consumer is doing really well. Hey, Chris, didn't the Fed yeah. make some methodological change here with this release? Yeah. Or Matt, do you know about yeah, that? I was just going to say, but Matt. Yeah, uh, and I guess that's a, it uh, now includes homeowners insurance and uh, property oh. taxes as like an escrow payment. Uh, so I don't uh, know. It's an aggregation, but uh, before it didn't. Is that your understanding of the methodological change, Chris? Well, the big change, yes, but um, the big change is that they the Fed is now using uh, consumer credit reports. What with that? Okay. To calculate the debt service before it was more of an estimation based on a variety of assumptions. So this is more direct, directly observed uh, data. But mm -hmm. but yeah, the uh, I, I guess a methodological change is that uh, because it is using the actual payments observed on the credit report for mortgage borrowers who do escrow, it's going to include their. Uh, property tax and insurance payments. They fed finally caught up to us, right? Because that's the way we were doing. Yeah, it. yeah our credit card debt service. Yeah, but but if you if you look at the current estimate, eleven point five is like exactly back to where it was pre pandemic. It's kind of like the average, close to the average historically, right? Something maybe a little lower than average historically. And from two thousand to twenty nineteen, it's a little lower uh, historically. 
has, is a little bit lower than that, but but even there, it's lower today than than yeah. historically average using that measure. Right, and I guess what's going on is lower income households who've taken on credit card consumer finance debt, their debt service is probably up, right? But that's getting that's their numbers are small relative to the debt payments made by middle and high income households, and those payments are are stable as a pancake probably because they all locked in the right. mortgage. <clears throat> Yeah, it's the mortgage debt that you know is really the driver here in terms right. of the dollar volume. So, yeah, those payments being low and stable, as you put it, you know that that really anchors that uh, that uh, debt service ratio. Yeah, I'm making this up, but it's roughly right. Uh, there's like what 16 trillion in total household debt outstanding. Twelve is mortgage. One and a half, one maybe is car credit cards. One and a half is auto. One and a half is student loan, roughly speaking. Yeah. Home equity loans are only 500 billion, you know, something like that. Very, very modest. Yeah. yeah. But so it's all about the mortgage debt and all, everyone, well, most people locked in uh, a 30 year or 15 year fixed rate mortgage when rates were very low. So they're, they're insulated. And that's one reason why, to your point, Matt, the consumer has continued to hang tough and drive the train. And, and one of the big differences with, uh, the rest of the world, uh, because households in the rest of the world have debt that are more closely tied to market rates, and they got hit by the run-up in rates globally. Right? Yeah. Okay. 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 Good. Uh, well, uh, Chris, do you want to go, or what do you oh, think? We can move on to the. Well, I think we're questions. kind of running out of time. This, yeah. we, we're already at an hour ten, I think. You know, something like that. That's kind of our. Somehow we always end up at one one ten. Do you have a good stat or how good is it? I'll I can save it. I can uh, save it. Save it. Okay, time. he's going to save it. Okay, uh, I think we'll then call this a a podcast. Any other? And again, pre, please send your questions. We will. I promise we will get to them because uh, we love those questions and uh, we'll carve out time for the next couple of podcasts to do that. But uh, anything else, guys? Before we call it a podcast, go Tigers. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, game on. Game on. All right. Tigers Mets World Series. You and I, Chris. We'll have to All right. Play some right. bets. Looking at you. <laughs> That's right. You're from you're you're from Michigan. I grew up in Michigan, yeah. Yeah. Very good. And uh, I'm rooting for I'm kind of rooting for the Tigers, right? Because well, I could root for the Mets too, believe it or not, because it's the underdog. They're not right? the Yankees. We got two. Yeah, under, we haven't, I, yeah I Mets have not won anything since nineteen eighty six. I yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'll spare you my rant about the Long Island sports fan and our hardships of the last <laughs> one day. It'll be another podcast. All right. Uh, no, no, I don't think so. We're not, doing not this podcast. <laughs> That's inside. Personal I'm, just I'm not, not, not going podcast. there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Adam Hurricane uh, Caymans, thanks for coming on. Mr. Collier, thanks for coming on. Good to see you guys, Marissa and, and Chris, and I hope you everyone has a good weekend. And uh, dear listener, we'll catch you next week. Take care now.